Uh, welcome to the Metropolitan Club. I'm Kermit Whitfield. Uh, I'm a member of the CMC's Board of Trustees and Senior Assistant Vice President of Communications at United Way of Central Ohio. It's great to see everybody here in a very full room. Today, CMC presents Hyperloop, Transforming Transportation, presented in partnership with the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, represented here by many friends and associates. Won't you please help me thank them? Columbus to Chicago in 30 minutes? That sounds pretty cool. And has tremendous ramifications for travel and transport of people and goods. How does it work? What does it look like? How much does it cost? And how do we get there? Let's leave it to our expert panel to explore those questions. Please welcome Director of Global Public Policy and North American Projects, Virgin Hyperloop One, Dan Katz. Vice President of ACOM, Ferzan Ahmed. <clears throat> Director of Transportation Systems and Funding at Morpsey, Thea Walsh. <clears throat> and our host, President and CEO of Molitoris Associates and the former Director of the Ohio Department of Transportation, Jolene Molitoris. Jolene, the podium is yours. Well, welcome everyone. What a great crowd you are out there. And I hope you're as excited to hear this story today as I am. As I was driving down here today, I was thinking about why it is such a pleasure to be a citizen of Columbus, Ohio. Columbus is a winner. Look at smart cities. We beat every competitor in the nation. And I think what you're gonna hear today from this astute panel is that Hyperloop One, Midwest Connect, is our way of embracing the future. We have the most talented panelists, but I must say something very important. They will tell you, I think, answer every question or at least be in the process of answering every question that you have. But we have some leadership in this city that embraces the future and competes for the future. And that's what this is all about. I want to just say that the mayor, I had a chance to talk with the mayor yesterday, and he could not be here today, but he has some astute leadership from the city here. And he is 100% with this program. We have Alex Fisher, who's sitting not too far away from here. He's president and CEO of the Columbus Partnership. We talked last week. His members and Alex are 100% behind this effort. And the man at Morpsey, William Murdoch. He's a man of the future, and that's why he has Thea on his team. We're going to have, uh, hopefully, short, informative, pithy kind of statements about different questions. And about a little before one, take your little notes and get up to that microphone and ask your questions, because all of them are welcome and all of them are important. Thea, I'm gonna start with you, because you and William, you've been thinking about this and doing about this for a long time. Yes. How did you get started? How's it looking? What do you think? All right. Well, um, it started all in uh, the fall of 2016. Um, we saw an opportunity to apply for a global challenge uh, to talk about a corridor uh, for Hyperloop. And we had been working on the idea of passenger rail between Columbus and Chicago for a couple of years at that time with um, cities along that corridor. Um, and so I talked to my team, which I have an amazing team who worked on, on this, uh, Dina Lopez. Nathaniel Kalin and Jijun Jang from Morpsey are actually uh, two of them are here today. Thank you so much for all your hard work because um, we were really under a tight time frame at first to get that in. 
Um, so once we got it in, we um, worked with Hyperloop One. We actually went to an interview. And in government, it's not a common thing that you go through an interview process for when we go for grants or something. So it's really a different format for us. We went to Washington and we rocked it. Um, and <laughs> as a result, we were selected as one of the 10 winners in the nation. And of course, we couldn't have done that, of course, with the partnership of the Columbus Partnership. And Alex actually went with us and has been a great supporter um, ever since. And so here we are today. Um, we've been uh, moving forward with that. We were one of the 10 winners in the world, 2,600 applications across the world. And we're one of the 10 winner routes um, as sitting here next to Hyperloop, talking about how we're going to advance that corridor. One of for in the United States. So su super excited about our next steps, which include Mr. Frizan Ahmed and AECOM and WSP as our consultants working with us on feasibility study, and then also the, the WSP side uh, being our environmental impact statement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dan, you know what people say, right? When can I buy a ticket? <laughs> How much is it going to cost? When? Talk a little bit about the technology and I also want you to mention how it can affect all the state, not just urban centers. Sure. So on the first question, I would say ask Thea and William, they'll give you the answer to those questions. Um, yeah, it's really a radical transformation that Hyperloop uh, can bring to a region. The ability to move uh, between what we're distinct metropolitan areas to really take advantage of a mega region. The idea that you can get to Pittsburgh in 20 minutes, get to Chicago in a half hour really changes the game. So, you know, when we look at the potential projects we can get involved in, you, you see how, you know, it can really change the fabric and the economy and boost the economy in these regions. And what we found really interesting about this project was that there was no rail connection between Pittsburgh and Columbus and say, well, there's actually, this is not a redundant system. This would be fulfilling a real need that's not there right now. So that's, so that's what's really exciting about this, that not only are we going to be able to provide a new mode, a new way of getting around, give people more options, but where we can, we can fill needs that need to be met, like the, the connection between here and Pittsburgh, um, that's something that's really gratifying for our work. And how about talking a little bit about the actual technology and sure. when, when I was FRA administrator, we invested a lot of money in maglev yes. and people maybe sometimes criticized us, but isn't this remarkable? Here we sit with maglev technology coming to its own. So yeah, I'll talk about two aspects. One is, so what is the Hyperloop fundamentally? And the core of it is that you travel within an enclosure that is brought down to very low pressure, the equivalent of flying at 200,000 feet. And what that does is that it all but eliminates aerodynamic drag and wind resistance. Um, so this is something that, you know, you face every day, literally face it. You're driving your car, you put your foot on the accelerator, you're going fast. Take your foot off the accelerator, you start to fight down. That's because you're fighting air drag and wind resistance in your car. In the Hyperloop environment, you take your foot off the accelerator, you keep going very fast for a very long time. So it is that dynamic that's at the core of the system. In terms of maglev, the maglev technologies uh, that Jolene was dealing with back uh, with FRA in those days, those were developed a long time ago and it was great innovation at the time, the German and Japanese systems. But what we were able to do is at our company, which formed in 2014, was bringing these, all these engineers from SpaceX and all these NASA, and just rethink it with the latest technology, state-of-the-art concepts around mag, you know, magnet technology. And so it's a vast, it's an incredible improvement upon some of those older designs uh, that really never got the commercialization that successfully. Uh, but this is really a very transformative way of, of of using levitation, uh, both you know within a vacuum uh, context of Hyperloop and even other contexts, we're going to we're, we're moving towards a system that you know replaces wheels um, with floating, which is pretty good for maintenance costs. I think. So. I think safety too. Yeah. For John, how about if you talk a little bit about 
the Midwest, the Great Lakes, sorry, the Great Lakes mega region, because that's what we are, the Great Lakes mega region. It's incredible what it contains, what the potential is. Talk a little bit about why this is such a great place to invest in Hyperloop. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I want to say something about a conversation that Thea and I had a couple of weeks ago when, when we saw the schedule and we realized that we were sandwiched between the governor and Dan Rather. Uh, <laughs> Looks like they've already made their choice who the best one is. Okay, so here we are, <laughs> here we are. Uh, the Great Lakes mega region, sometimes also known as the Megapolis, which is a megapolis, which I, uh, actually almost sounds like something out of a Batman movie, but uh, it's not quite as sinister. It is, uh, it is a region that contains almost 60 million people. You can go as far as, as northern, um, as, as southern part of Ontario, and you can go all the way down to uh, Cincinnati in Ohio, and then up to, uh, Chicago. So basically, this is a region that is extremely densely populated. That's one-sixth of the population of the United States. Uh, back when I was at ODOT, we used to talk about uh, being right here in central Ohio and being uh, within one day's driving distance to 60% of the population of the United States. As long as my daughter is not in the car with you, that ain't happening. But. <laughs> But in general, but in general, that was the case. So that this is a smaller version of that 60% of the population. So why is this important? It's important because we have all these centers, starting with you know Pittsburgh at that end, uh, Columbus, Chicago, uh, Fort Wayne, and and then other parts. You, you director, you also mentioned how this affects other cities within Ohio. It's not just about Columbus, because ultimately it's about population serving the population. What are we serving? Freight. When we have 60 million people in a small, compact region, when you look at the entire country, this is actually a compact region, we're talking about 60 million users of goods, and this is only going to increase. In 2000, our population was 285 million people. Today, it's uh, somewhere <laughs> close to 330 million people. So that's only going to increase, and guess where we're going to see a lot of that increase? In the megapolis. So having this technology, Hyperloop, to address our future need of freight and making sure that we service the needs of all these people here, I think is imperative. I think it's I think it's a no-brainer. I think uh, just it's very exciting to be at the at the ground floor. But I think what's really important to know is that in order for us to keep growing and keep progressing the way we have, it is imperative that we look at this brand new technology. Great, thank you, Thea. Could you talk a little bit about how the little off ramps? Uh, really compare this more to a highway in a way than it does to a regular rail line so that people in uh, at all different parts of Ohio are going to be able to benefit. All right, Dan, back me up on this one, all right? <laughs> all right, <laughs> I'm talking about the technology. So um, it does work a little different from what you would think a passenger train or a freight train would work. Um, you may think that you get on a uh, Hyperloop at a station and then the cars behind you have to wait while you get off at another station. Well, in fact, it's very much like the interstate. You're in an individualized pod or your freight is in an individualized pod and it can actually ramp off to its destination um, and there's no schedules. Um, it's all uh, very much like Uber. You order it up. Maybe you stand there for a couple minutes, wait for that to come uh, and then take off uh, on your trip. You may have other people who actually ordered it up with you. It may be something where you are the only person in the car or the only stuff in that car at that time. But the idea being that this is truly at, at the speed of business or people um, and a, a product that um, is very different from one that we've had before when we drive ourselves or we are on a service that's already there for us to utilize. Well, I think that inclusiveness is so important. Because yes. too often people think it's just about the urban core. But Ohio has beautiful, wonderful cities throughout. Some are small, some are big, and some are in between. And so having the opportunity to share this mobility for whatever purpose you have, whether it's education or medical services or uh, business or quality of life, it's very important that everybody have a shot at it. Um, I don't know, maybe... Dan, talk about our partnerships. When, when we were declared one of four winners in the United States, when smart cities became ours, um, 
they talk about the Columbus Way, and it's the way of putting the bigger picture first before yourself. How does that affect how you work with a client or a possible corridor? Yeah, we, we saw that in the MORPC proposal. Uh, a lot of the other proposals were, well, let's have Hyperloop within our state. You know, it was like, you know, we're Colorado, we want Hyperloop in our state. You know, MORPC thought bigger, thought about let's go through a, the entire Midwest. Let's have a vision for how we can connect to the communities around us. My first reaction was, oh, wow, that's four states. That's a lot of jurisdictions to deal with. And I found out last night driving here from Pittsburgh, there's a fifth state in a way. <laughs> West Virginia. I know, yeah, like, why is West Virginia sticking up here? I couldn't quite understand that. But, you know, but that was indicative of the way Morpsey was tackling. The issue was we're not gonna do something very small and parochial. We're going to solve a big problem, not just for, you know, Columbus and the area and central Ohio, but for really the country and making sure there's better connectivity. So that made the project very attractive to it. Too. Right. The, um, the whole idea of partnerships, the whole idea of innovation. Um, what about freight? I personally am very excited because at least what I know, uh, this corridor is the only one that's looking at a freight first proof of concept piece. To me, that is brilliant. Who wants to talk about yeah, that? I'm going to say a couple things about freight. Um, one of our biggest investors and partners is DP World, Dubai Ports World, which is one of the largest port operators uh, in the world. And you know they're interested in us for the freight potential. And it's really exciting talking to them because you know they, they look at the way we move things around the world and find it kind of antiquated and want to rethink the entire system. Um, from a top, top to bottom review. And so they, they see Hyperloop playing a huge role in cargo movements. And they also are thinking, okay, we know about the, the ports of New York and New Jersey. We know about the port of LA and Long Beach, but maybe we should do this a different way. Maybe we should move things a different way, look at other centers around the world and utilize the latest technology and air cargo and you know bigger planes, et cetera. And, figure out a way to, to do this that might be smarter. So the cargo possibilities coming out of this are really quite tremendous and we're excited about it. You know, from an operations perspective, I'll, uh, I'll throw in a couple of things that, that will make a lot of people um, here relate to how this is so important for freight. See Dr. Marshbanks from ODOT sitting in the audience. One of the things that we see uh, in and around Columbus is that this is basically a, a hub for freight uh, mm -hmm. with, with Rick and Barker so close to where we are and uh, let's not forget Marion, the Marion intermodal connector. So we have a tremendous amount of freight that moves through here, and all that freight ends up on semis on I-270. And you know what happens the first time one of those semis overturns. Unfortunately, that happens altogether too often, or a uh, or, uh, uh, semi just breaks down. It's, it's a gridlock in the city. And as the megapolis or mega region increases and the population and the freight needs increase, you know that the number of uh, trucks uh, or the freight, the amount of freight that needs to be moved around is going to increase. I think having this technology is going to solve some of the problems that we see every day in our region. Uh, there's also been a lot of conversation about building a bypass around Delaware so that Detroit to Columbus freight movement is easier. I think he's got that bypass right there. I think this technology is going to solve a lot of problems that we have been trying to tackle for a couple of decades and we have not been able to figure out how to do so. And Thea, the, the whole freight business can be very profitable. Mm -hmm. And do you know of anybody else that has included uh, a freight element for the proof of concept? Well, uh, I, we weren't uh, the ones who actually reviewed all the proposals, but I do know in talking to our peers when we were at our interview in the, in the um, global uh, competition in Washington last year uh, that the folks in Texas, in the Texas Triangle, seem to have a focus on that between Houston, um, Austin, um, and Dallas. So that seemed to be a focus of theirs as well. But I don't remember it really being a part of any other. Dan, I don't know if you um, have a good concept of uh, some of the other proposals. There were some, some other ones. Some were good, some were incredibly bad. I'll just share one <laughs> bad one with you. Um, sure, go for we really we got a we got a proposal, and I'm not kidding. 
to build a, a hyperloop along the border with Mexico as part of the wall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was very strange. So that was on the bad category of ideas. <laughs> um, but, you know, there, I think Morpsey's was the soundest cargo proposal we saw, certainly in the U.S., and so we were, you know, very excited about, about that one. And, and what about the proof of concept? I, I know that people want to want to buy a ticket, right? And so timing is so important. And that piece between Rickenbacker and John Glenn is short enough to be doable soon so that everybody can see and watch and understand that it's actually working on that small venue. I think it's a, a very, um, it's a good, a very good approach. Yeah, no, we're excited about the possibility. Uh, we do have a need for kind of a phase one you know, test track beyond what we already have, which is a half a kilometer test track uh, in Nevada, uh, you know, where we've got the pot up to 240 miles an hour and only 300 meters of acceleration, but we need to go further. And so we do need that first, you know, proof of concept in a longer alignment, like 13 kilometers, something like that. And, and you know, the, the airport connector gets us there. Absolutely. Any other comment on uh, some of those elements of the of next steps? Because I think people want to know about next steps. How, how soon, how much, when? Absolutely. Well, first of all, the acceleration is impressive, and it's even faster than William drives, which, <laughs> which, itself, which itself is impressive. But I've, I've got a team of engineers sitting right here at that table. Um, and uh, you know, when you talk about what are the next steps, of course, Coming from an engineering and operations background, we think of a project in terms of how do you get it started, how do you progress it, and where does it end? The culmination of all of this, obviously, is going to be that, in Central Ohio, is going to be that first piece between Rickenbacker and, uh, and the Columbus Airport. Hopefully, that's, that's uh, what we're going to be looking at. But how do we get there? And you know, it has to first start with looking at feasibility of that corridor. How do you build it? Every engineering, to us, this is an engineering project. And every engineering project starts with doing that study. What are the existing conditions? What does it take for us to get there? What are the environmental ramifications? Right of way issues that we have to deal with. Uh, soil conditions and so on and so forth. You know, and, and one, once you've got that study conducted and once you've got an actual corridor that you're looking at, that this is where it's feasible for us to build this, that's when we get into elements of actual engineering. So there are two aspects of the system. The first aspect of the system is the uh, uh, technology itself. And I'll let Dan talk about that because they've got that portion covered. They actually have that completely developed. The second part of that system is the implementation or the integration of that technology. And that starts with what we're going to be starting here very soon, and that's the feasibility study. When it's, I should mention that I know Joanna is not here from CODA. I think Mike Bradley and some others are here. But the fact is, Joanna was in charge of the test track uh, that uh, Ohio State and Honda and the state of Ohio shared. So I think we have some built-in expertise. We can get rolling. Oh, yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, Ohio is a, always a hub of transportation technology innovation, obviously, with aviation up to, the, sorry, North Carolina, but I know, you know, it's Ohio. Um, That's right. Good Glad you had that right. Yeah, just don't, don't tell uh, Secretary Fox I said that. <laughs> but, you know, so you have these, you've proven that, you know, new technologies uh, have a home here and can be tested here, and there's an interest in innovating. So that's why, you know, for us, not just the project, but also research and development is an attractive concept here as well. Mm -hmm. How about vehicles? One thing we know is manufacturing. Some long time ago, Japanese people came here with motorcycles, and if you look about every other car, is a Honda out there. So uh, what about your vehicles? Can you manufacture them right here? Well, so that's a great question. I mean, as you know, um, high-speed rail is uh, not an American enterprise. It's, uh, these are all non-American companies that have really um, jumped out at ahead and, and uh, we don't have a we don't have a piece of that of that market uh, we kind of get left behind not just in developing high-speed rail but also um, in terms of you know the manufacturing and innovation there so this is an opportunity for the US to really innovate again take a leap forward on this technology do better than high-speed rail um, and have it developed and, and built in the US 
you know, frankly, for the manufacturer of our vehicles, um, we know we need to work with a partner mm -hmm. to do that who who have made vehicles. And, you know, I think automotive plays a role, uh, rail plays a role, but also aerospace does play a big role because if you look at who has a history of making, you know, vehicles that can travel in a low pressure environment um, and keep it pressurized inside a cabin, you know, aerospace is a, is a very good candidate for that. So, you know, we, we'd love to, we want to partner with, with a manufacturer to do that for us and, and certainly given Buy America rules that you know pretty well, you know, you want to do the manufacturing here in the U.S. for U.S. projects. Actually, in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I meant to say, right. yeah. <laughs> How about a couple of comments, um, Thea, in terms of, say, the, the doubters out there who think, ah, this is a lot of talking. What can you say to them about what you've seen? Because I know you've been immersed in this, and William and so many others, and um, how can we get them to be, at least see the potential for right. this technology? So. When we were working on the proposal, we really kind of delved into the different um, areas of expertise, like health industry, manufacturing, food, what it would do for this area of the country. Um, and so those, those were those, um, wow, what a transformative technology moment. But then add that to, we've had the chance to actually go and physically touch this technology, see the people who work with it. And I have to say that uh, we've taken two delegations out to the Hyperloop facility, the DevLoop facility um, out in Nevada. And from that experience, I've actually got to see people, I saw an Ohio mayor say, this is going to change the way we move in this country, right? I, I saw him change his complete demeanor while he was there and, and realize this is real, right? And to me, it wasn't as much about the technology, but it was meeting the real people who work on it every day and realizing there wasn't a question I could throw at them that was a zinger or like that they couldn't, hadn't already thought of. Um, because I saw people do it for hours while I was there. <laughs> and, you know, so I, I'm just amazed at the team that they have behind them. Um, and just know also, this is not the only company doing this, but this is the company that has proof of their concept on the ground in the United States. Right. So I'm pretty excited about working with them because of that. Right. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, I, I worked at the U.S. Department of Transportation before I came to Hyperloop, and you get a lot of people coming through your door. I know Morpsey gets it. Everybody in the transportation agency gets it, making claims about what they're capable of doing. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, sometimes uh, you see, you know, agencies might jump before they really figure out if something's real. Uh, but to Morpsey's credit, they really put us through tremendous due diligence. Um, they, they came out for site visits. They questioned our engineers. They did all the things that you need to do to make sure that this is legit, and you know you should be very proud of that work. Because I've, I, you know, sometimes it doesn't always work out that way. And but in Morpsey's case, they really did uh, do a great job of due diligence on this. One sort of last question. I think we're getting up to the uh, uh, your question time. When you embrace the future, it means that we want the best resources, the best talent, the best quality of life, right here in our mega region, in Ohio and the mega region. And I personally want people in high school in California when asked what they want to do is, we want to go to the mega region, we want to go to Ohio because they've got the best of everything. I think that's one of the platforms that have to be at the top of our agenda. I think, Alex, it's at the top of yours, this resource and, and talent and the young blood of the new age that's coming. How do you see kind of a wrap-up question. How do you see this technology and this project of working together really making this happen? Well, uh, the first thing I'll say is, um, you know, we have a long-standing relationship with Virgin Hyperloop One. We are also uh, the consultants that are working with them in Colorado. That's how I see it. Um, right now in the country, Colorado is considered to be the leader in this technology. Uh, William, uh, Thea, Dan, uh, we need to change that. Uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to progress our project and 
You talk about how we can do this, how we can make ourselves visible, results speak louder than anything else. I think that our personal goal, I know it's my goal, I know it's Thea's goal, I know Thea very well, there are very few people more enthusiastic than her, and I, I have a feeling that Dan is not gonna mind if we say that we need to make Central Ohio uh, the place in the United States of America where this technology is progressing. And I think that if we are able to show the results, and we, let me rephrase, when we are able to show those results, and that is when people are gonna realize that in conjunction with all the great things that we are doing with Smart Columbus, with Drive Ohio, and with Hyperloop, with Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, people will see that things are really are, are happening in Central Ohio, and this is the place where people need to come in. Amen. So Dan, um, where do we stand exactly in all of the other proposals in the United States? <laughs> um, comparatively, could you, could you tell us about where, where we are in the process? Oh, yeah. um, Go, it's clearly number one, and we're going to make everything here in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> no, but sir, uh, you know we um, we have ties to this region in the company. Our our um, one of our co-founders and chief technology officer is from down the road in Pittsburgh. One of our top uh, female engineers went to Ohio State, went to the welding school. Go Bucks! Yeah, and. Uh, Kristen Hammer, she's awesome. And so, you know, there is a, a very strong pull to this region. A lot of our engineers, you know, we think about where we want to develop technology, what's an attractive place where we can find talent we need to work on our systems. Um, they, they know about this region and they talk about this region. So, you know, there's definitely excitement. Um, you know, people in California excited about, you know, what's going on here in Columbus. That's a real thing. That's, that's big. Yeah. Wrap up, uh, Thea. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we are a growing region um, from our Insight 2050 study. We, we will grow by up to a million, maybe even more uh, by 2050, right? And with that, we, of course, uh, are going to need ways to get people around the region. But with an attractive region, we want people to be able to come in and out of this region and be able to have the workforce we need and have the tools we need to get people from in and out. So I I feel like this is definitely one of the ways we need to continue exploring and um, work to advance it in Central Ohio and across the mega region. Thank you for all your insights and I'd like to invite uh, people to come up to the microphone. Is there a microphone there? I think I see Kimberly Gibson. Hey. <laughs> Kimberly, welcome. Thank you, Jolene and guests. I can't tell you it is a great time to be alive. So many changes happening, and it's the best time ever to be in Central Ohio. Thank you for being here today. The leadership that Morpsey has demonstrated is epic. They've always demonstrated it. Now they're just getting recognized for this particular one. My question is about the partnerships that you're gonna need to fund this over the long term and how that is shaking out. I don't see a lot of robber barons hanging out in every corner, there are a few, and that was how the first rail thing happened. So I would just like to get some perspective on how y'all are approaching that in a modern age. Well, thank you for asking that, Kim. And I think you, Kim was around during the proposal time frame and, and that uh, to speak to a little bit about how we even got off the ground financially with the Columbus Partnership help um, is that businesses actually donated in-kind services or very low-rate services to us, and, and her business actually was one of them. We produced a 3D model to take and show to Hyperloop the population of the Midwest so they could actually see it in, like, little spikes. It was so cool. Um, so, uh, you know, so even pulling together businesses from around Central Ohio on small parts of this project was very important in the early part. Now we're moving to the more difficult, the big number. And that will be fed to us via the feasibility study. Certainly, we'll learn more about the costs associated with this. And then, you know, we're going to be talking to ca capital companies. And I actually have already does started that process. But in addition to that, 
Um, you know, it may t take a matter of local government measures um, and conversations across the Midwest um, and, um, you know, business partnerships as well. So it'll be a number of things, but I think understanding and knowing that cost from our study will, of course, be the first thing we have to figure out in order to make that happen. But we're working on it, Kim. Thank you. Next question. Hi, <clears throat> good afternoon. I'm Kathy Fox. I'm with the Pizzuti Companies. And my question is a bit of um, a takeoff on Kimberly's, except that I'm curious about what the crossover point is on size, scale, volume of this technology and when it becomes uh, cost effective compared to current methods of transportation. And have you looked at that and do you know what you're shooting for? Yes, I mean, that's a lot of what our engineers are working on is how to make the system uh, efficient and bring down the cost of CapEx uh, for building the system, operating the system, et cetera. Uh, that's something we're extremely cognizant of. And you know, in terms of cargo operations, that's something DP World's working with us on, like how do we optimize uh, the use of cargo here and make it, um, you know, make sure that it's, uh, it, it does make sense from a, from a cost benefit analysis. And you know, that we keep working on bringing that number lower and lower and lower on costs in this system. Because um, you could build the Hyperloop right now, uh, today, but you're not, it's not gonna be at the right price point. So we're continually working to bring that, that point down. Okay. Thank you. Hello, I'm John McKnight from Rife's Auto Body. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, have you, or do you anticipate receiving pushback from um, trucking industry, railroads, uh, shipping industry, uh, the uh, industries that are currently doing all of our cargo transportation right now? Um, and the second quick question is, what kind of Gs do you feel when you're going from zero to 200 miles an hour in 300 yards? Yeah, okay. All Thank right, you. so on the first one, uh, we've actually had a really, a uh, great set of dialogues with the other modes of transport. Um, we, we approach them with how can we plug into your systems to help you. So, you know, we talk with the railroads about, you know, you have issues with inland terminals, you need some relief. Um, you have, you know, ports where it's too congested to get, get the containers inland to process them. Um, so we, we've had really productive conversations with railroads, um, also with airports. Um, you know, and I think, you know, in the future, there's a lot of issues around trucking that need to be sorted out, and they're gonna have a, you know, uh, automated trucks happening, and so that industry's gonna go through some changes. But, you know, all the interactions we've had with other modes have been really, really positive. We approach it as, we're not replacing you, we are working to enhance the entire system. Uh, on G-forces, um, that acceleration we did at the test track, we're not gonna do with people. <laughs> it would be, <laughs> that would not be a pleasant experience. We just wanted to uh, see how fast we can get it. Um, the G-force modeling we do is standard to, you know, transit and commuter rail G-forces that we're modeling right now. And, you know, essentially what that's like is our takeoff and landing, so to speak, our acceleration deceleration profile is gonna be about half the G-force of taking off and landing in an airplane. So it'll be really comfortable and, you know, it'll be like an airplane but without turbulence. So, you know, our engineers, um, and I know Morpsey's met quite a few of them, you know, they pride themselves and they boast about this, about um, how they're managing G-force in all directions so you won't feel a thing uh, when you're on the system. You can put your, gl your glass on the table and, you know, it's not gonna move no matter what angle you're at. Um, and I've. I didn't take physics in high school, but I've learned a lot from these people. So uh, <laughs> let's see if I get extra credit now. I just wanted to thank you for that question, sir, because I think this whole idea of not replacing, but actually understanding this as a whole system is a very important point we need to enhance. I'm Mike Carnes from Aerial Image Solutions and Infinite Impact. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a Hyperloop fanboy. I feel like I've been following this since the white paper back in the early 2010s. 
Um, but I've been wondering, so you've got the test track, the half kilometer test track, it's up close to 300 miles an hour. Do you have plans on expanding that to hit that target of roughly 700 miles an hour? Or do you expect to use something like the, the Rickenbacker to John Glenn connection as the first iteration of that, that proposed speed? And I don't even know if you do that proposed speed between there probably, but. Well, yeah. Expanding here. Well, you know, that's, that's the point. I mean, I think what our, our, we're thinking now is, okay, for the next generation test track that's got to be longer, we want it to be something that can turn into a useful um, asset afterwards. So, it, well, you know, we, we don't want to build it. We, we built one out in the desert, um, but we don't want to do that again. If we're going to do a longer test track, we want it to be something that can be converted to a useful operation. So that's why the airport connector is a very intriguing concept to do that there because, you know, you can, you can build it, we can test on it, and then you can start off transporting cargo, which you know is, you know, is a less risky venture than transporting people at first. So, um, you know, so it is. We do want to take it to the next level. We want to make it something that can become a useful asset in the future. Hi, Jolene, Stu Nicholson, uh, with All Aboard Ohio. A couple of questions. Um, clearly, the Hyperloop will be extremely attractive to the executive traveler that needs to move at a, at a fast pace. But my question is, and two-part question, what will be the utility of this for the average uh, traveler, you know, if you will, whether they're a business or discretionary traveler? And secondly, I'm also aware that, that, uh, that Morpsey has also been looking at a 110 mile an hour rail corridor between Columbus and Chicago, and I'd just kind of like to get an update on that. Um, so first about the technology and affordability for, for everybody, you know, this is certainly not something we'd want to look into if it was beyond the means of kind of the average person being able to use it. And we do realize that, of course, um, utilizing it for freight might help sub subsidize or offset some of those costs um, for, for the average traveler. We don't have specifics on it, but I know it's something that Hyperloop can actually address. And then I'll go ahead and answer the other yeah, question sure. real quick and you can take it. Yeah, I, mean, um, I, you know, we are working on a rapid speed transportation initiative, which actually includes an environmental impact statement, which can be used for both Hyperloop and or passenger rail uh, on the corridor that we propose between Chicago and Pittsburgh. Um, so uh, we're actually getting started on that environmental impact statement. The reason why that's so important, it's, it's important to passenger rail, of course, because that, that could be the technology if Hyperloop doesn't pan out but also it's uh, just due di good due diligence for us because there are no, currently there are not any standards for Hyperloop in the US. And so the only way we do have to measure how we're going to be able to move forward is by standards that exist today. And so that's why we're doing that. Um, so I feel like it's, it's a good measure regardless of what technology gets chosen in the future and it will certainly give us the information we need to advance it. So go ahead, sorry, cost. Yeah, so on cost, <laughs> I mean, our, our philosophy is that um, this endeavor will not be useful if it's something that people can't afford. And we don't intend it to be a luxury service. It's not a limousine. Uh, it's meant to be something that's accessible to everyday people and useful to get the ridership numbers we need. So, you know, our focus is to make it something affordable to, to make sure people can utilize it and working with our partners, I think everyone's on the same page on that. Thank you. Hi, Michael. I'm Michael Connor and Jolene, thank you very much for letting me know about this. I'm a uh, railroad man and I felt like a lost party here tonight, but or this afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I might want to point out to you, you mentioned Pittsburgh. The rail line from here to Mingo Junction, I was involved with the state in acquiring that from the blue the, the Blue Plague, Conrail, the worst railroad ever formed in the United States. And I worked for them too, so. But uh, we bought that railroad from them and we saved it all the way to the river. Conrail on its own, in order to stop us from getting to Pittsburgh, has abandoned 22 miles of line, partly in that portion of West Virginia you talked about. It can be put back. Mike, I'm waiting for your question. My question real simply is, why have we not considered the, to me, the real simple answer, let's put passenger rail back on that line. Columbus is the largest metropolitan complex in the northern, in the western hemisphere, as I understand it, with no 
urban rail, no suburban rail, and no intercity rail passenger service. And I, I think that while this Hyperloop is an interesting concept, we got real things that could be done immediately to put passenger service in. Thank you. That actually the the corridors we're looking at include that alignment, and we are actually looking at it for both the feasibility for Hyperloop as well as the feasibility and environmental impact for passenger rail. So we will be looking at that at the same time um, on that corridor. Can I add something to that? We, we started this conversation by talking about a mega region, and one of the things we have to keep in mind is as the world is changing, it's not just about Columbus or Pittsburgh or Chicago. It's about a lot of these regions working together. Uh, if you take a large company such as ours or many others, we've got people working in Pittsburgh and people working in Columbus, and there are times when we need them to be elsewhere. Right now, that is not commuting distance. If that were commuting distance, which is what the future demands, these th this mega region can really act as a mega region, and I think what we are able to accomplish from uh, uh, from uh, economic development and from business growth, I, I don't think that we even we can even begin to realize the potential of what we can do if we have that connection. Well, and the Midwest is also a great place where tax reciprocity already exists between states, which means when somebody works in one state and lives in another, they're not going to be double taxed in many cases. So we already have a good model set up in this area of the country for this type of um, commuting. So now here's a mechanism to actually take that to the next level. Okay, three more questions real quick. My name is Fred Ray, and I'm a member of All Aboard Ohio, so I'm obviously a rail enthusiast, but I've also worked for years doing trajectories for NASA when I worked for Battelle. There's one number that I have never heard any of you discuss. What G-force are you anticipating these passengers will be willing to tolerate? You know, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I know that it's the standard for, for passenger rail and transit. Um, that's the same g-force level that we're working with you can do half an hour from Columbus to Chicago at classic accelerations right and make it in that time mm -hmm. yeah in fact we we have an engineer who puts together okay. a really great acceleration profile for these routes and uh, you know we we can share some of that data that shows the acceleration profile uh, using the g-force level what the cruising speed is and then a deceleration well, profile. This is one number, though. What do you think a human being can tolerate? Are we going to redesign that before we fly? I can text him now to get the actual G-force uh, <laughs> level. That's a well, good idea. Yeah. We, we, Let I, me I, see I if I can fast. do that. I'll, I'll text him. Yeah, it's just we have Andrew, and we have two more questions real fast, and then we've got to cut it off. I know we're at 114, Andrew. Okay. What is the, what is the proposed timeline for the feasibility study? followed up by the actual implementation. If everything looks good, it's a perfect world, no huge hangups. When can this thing go in between Rick and Bacher and John Glenn? I can say my part. Uh, so feasibility study, nine months from this month, 12 months on the environmental impact segment components that we're starting. Um, that will lead us to additional information to study and look at for decision makers and then Building like a segment, like a small starter segment, how long would that take from well, that point? Yeah, I mean, I th we're looking at having, you know, something uh, up and running or at least being built. Construction to start 2020 in that time frame on a test, a net, whatever the next test track iteration is, 2019, 2020. And then we're hoping for service. Um, in the early 2020s, or at least operational for certification. So that first piece is going to be Rickenbacker to John Glenn, right? Yeah, it just might be. And it's, all, it's being made in Ohio. That's right. And the vehicle's made here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more last question, please. Uh, quickly, um, <clears throat> will Hyperloop One have the power of eminent domain? Sorry. 
if one is, is a private company and they wouldn't be in the position to do that, that would be more of a role of local government um, in, in the process of, of, or the state government in the process of defining the project, especially if it was a federally funded project that, that we would have to follow all the rules and laws that are out there. So, thank you. Well, thank you to our wonderful panel. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, speakers. Hope you enjoyed today's forum. I know I did, I learned an awful lot. Um, let's thank our partner, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission. And our speakers, Dan Katz, Furzan, Ahmed, Thea Walsh, and Jolene Militaris. And thank all of you. We'll see you next week.